Hi and welcome to this webinar. Today I'll be talking about mixing drums. I'll be using the Renaissance bundle and the One Knob bundle. So only with these plugins. Let's have a listen to how the drums sound just as they were recorded. So that's a good uh, starting point. Uh, let's look at the kick drum. I'm going to start by um, putting a gate on uh, because I want to get rid of the snare drum spill and the cymbals for that matter. Um, so I'm going to use the Renaissance channel. The Renaissance channel um, is basically a few plugins put together um, to resemble a desk channel. So it has the logical sort of workflow of an analog mixing desk. So we have the EQ, we have compressor, we have a gate. We have two types of compression. We have the Rvox and the Renaissance compressor types, which we can change here. And the Renaissance Vox is a soft knee compressor. It's really good for vocals and bass and guitars. For drums, I would use the Renaissance compressor type, um, as we'll see in a minute. But let's start with the gate. So I'm going to bypass the compressor. Um, on the gate, I have two modes as well, expander and gate. I'm going to choose gate because I want to basically kill all the spill from the uh, other drums. Um, and it's very easy to see how the signal of the kick is metering. Uh, and then I can just set the threshold to allow just the kick drum hits to filter through. Um, what I can also do here is I can engage uh, a filter which will be placed on the side chain for the um, gate. And this would be good if I use a high pass filter, which is the default settings, because uh, what will happen then is that the energy detector will look at the higher frequencies, which um, actually arrive quicker than the lower frequencies. If we zoom in, on the actual kick hit, we can see the high frequency content here at the very front of the, the kick drum hit generated by the pedal hitting the skin. So we have a lot of high frequency content here and the, the lower frequencies, you can see them building up to create the fundamental frequency of the kick drum. So if we filter them out, the gate will not be mistaking um, them to be the trigger point or the uh, threshold um, to open the kick, which will then make um, the, the, the kick basically gated too much on the front of the heat. So obviously we're going to lose a lot of energy when we cut the uh, low frequencies on the side chain, so we have to allow for a more sensitive threshold. You see that the threshold has lowered, the, the actual signal has lowered in level, so we have to follow with, a, with the threshold slider, and then we can shorten the release time. Maybe I can give it a lower frequency than 700, maybe around 400. Yeah, that makes more sense. And now I can actually try to see if it sounds better on the expander settings. It sounds smoother. And if I bypass the whole thing,
I can see that we actually get a clear sound on the kick drum. Now we can engage the compressor. The compressor, like I said, I'm going to use the Renaissance compressor. And the gain reduction meter is uh, joined for the gate and the compressor. So I'm going to bypass the gate the expander for a minute so I can just get a clearer view of the compression. So I'm going to set the ratio at about 4 to 1 because I want quite a lot of compression and then I'm just going to lower the threshold until I get it quite compressed. But I'm going to allow some of the initial heat to filter through the compression so I'm going to raise the attack to around 5-6 milliseconds so the actual compression will take place only after the initial heat has uh, passed through so that creates more punch and the release time can be um, approximately the same time can have the same time of the kick drum so we know that once one hit uh, went through, the compression will go back to um, zero gain reduction, ready for the next kick drum hit to come and activate it. Um, so that's, you can see that, or you can hear rather that it makes the kick a lot tighter, a lot more solid um, and more predictable. So now we can engage the gate back in and we have a very kind of controlled and tight kick drum. We can then move on to the EQ. Let me flatten everything and then I'm just gonna flip the EQ in. I'm gonna filter out any frequencies below 30 Hertz because it will be just rumble which can interfere with the bass and just create um, an unnecessary mud in the very low frequencies. And then I'm just going to add some low frequencies at around maybe 60, something like that, just to make it more heavy and to fill out the the, the, the low frequency range. Um, also, I'm just going to add some punch at around 3k. And I think that that's probably it. Actually, I'm going to just use that frequency to cut around 100. Yeah, there's a lot you can hear that there's some unpleasant kind of boxiness. I can get rid of some of that um, and then use the high band to bring out the punch at around 3-4k. So that sounds very tight. Now we can move on to the snare. And for the snare I'm just going to copy the same settings from the kick drum to the snare drum because that would be a good starting point. I can flatten the EQ because obviously the EQ would behave completely different on the snare drum. And let's bypass the EQ and bypass the compression and just set up the gate. So I can set it up in a way that I get only the snare drum hits coming through which sounds pretty good at the moment a little bit of compression now for the snare drum I'm gonna try the Renaissance Vox the R Vox because uh, it has um, soft knee compression so I think that the compression will be less noticeable and it would sound more even and continuous. So I think that that seems to work fine. 
and then I can just EQ it a little bit, add some top. That sounds sweet. Some punch at around one and a half K and find the body of the snare, which will be around the fundamental um, frequency of the actual drum. So that would be somewhere around there. So let's hear the kick and snare together. So that sounds pretty tight to me. Um, now we can add the bottom mic, snare drum mic. It's important to have a look to zoom in and see whether they're both um, in phase because naturally they will be out of phase because one mic would be picking up the snare from the top and one from the bottom and the snare will the snare skin will vibrate in one direction so it will hit both mics in reversed phase so in this case, it seems like the, the um, just by looking at it, it seems like this, the bottom snare drum mic was further down. So we have kind of a bit of a latency on the snare drum. So the phasing is not going to be an issue here. Uh, let's hear them together though. but I can, I can feel that the, I'm losing some low end by introducing the bottom snare mic. So let me try to flip the phase um, on this mic by using again the Renaissance channel. Let me just flatten everything because I'm not going to be using compression nor gate or EQ um, and then just no I think it's better without it so we don't need that so I'm just going to leave it as it was recorded uh, and just balance it So the snare is much tighter without the bottom snare mic, but it sound, sounds a little bit dull and short. And by introducing the bottom mic, it brings it back uh, to life and uh, with all the subtleties of the playing. So that's, that's sounding pretty good. Yeah. And now we can listen to the hi-hat. On the hi-hat, um, I'm going to try to use the one knob louder, which is basically um, just a one knob applied to a few compression engines which uh, basically all the, all the one knob series um, have one knob so it's, they're very easy to uh, control but under the hood there's a lot going on so in this case we have a few compressors, limiters uh, set up in a way that uh, in a very sophisticated, sophisticated way uh, with control laws that um, you know, creates a, a very smooth operation, but um, activates a lot of processing power. And um, so what I'm going to do is to try to get the hi-hat to sound very kind of solid. So all the hits are the same, relatively, and we, we can hear that already. If I bypass that, you hear that kind of inconsistency of the hi-hat playing 
but here we just bring them all to one sort of level and one um, similar focus and then obviously we added to the overall level so we can bring the fader down and then listen to it with the rest of the drums. So we can hear the height is very present as opposed to without where it's kind of comes and goes. So pretty much like that we can pan it to the side a little bit. I always pan, pan drums uh, from the drummer's perspective the same in the same way that mostly you'll find the piano um, is panned from low to high from left to right uh, so I consider the drums uh, I treat the drums in the same way so the hi-hat is here and the tones go like that and the right is there um, so I'm gonna pan the hi-hat slightly to the left and now we can move on to the overheads the overheads play a very big role in the overall drum sound because they pick up not only the cymbals but the whole kind of um, vibe of the kick of the of the whole kit and uh, if they're recorded well and they are in in this case it can give you a picture of the whole drum kit so you can hear that the the cymbals are coming through much louder because the, the overhead mics are placed relatively close to the cymbals more than anything else um, and they can they sound quite splashy uh, so we want to get less attack and more sustain out of those cymbals so I'm going to use the louder again for that purpose so you see I'm bringing everything now I'm going to use that into in a more extreme way just to see how how far I can take it. And the, the great thing about the one off series, um, the louder, for instance, is that you don't get any pumping because of the way we designed it to use uh, different types of compression uh, methods. Uh, for every setting of the knob uh, you don't get any pumping and you get the, the, the sweet sound out of e every type of compression as you go along so I'm gonna back this down a little bit and I'm going to use the R box um, to compress the overheads even more and that will create really sweet kind of vintage slightly vintage sounding um, the compression slider actually has an auto makeup gain so as I compress the gain goes up to compensate so the peak level stays at around the same area Obviously the RMS is going to be a lot louder. Um, and now we need some brightness and some control over the mid-range. So first of all I'm gonna take out those nasty frequencies that's around, yeah, around 2K. take them out a little bit and then add some high frequencies not too much and then I can filter out the very low frequencies because we don't really need them and let's see how that sounds together with the rest of it
Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Now we have the room mics, which I'm not even sure we're gonna use on this track, but let's see if we can get an interesting tone out of them. Maybe I can use the filter and the driver. So I, sometimes I like distorting some or all the drums uh, because it just creates a richer tone. So and for that, it really brings it to life. So that sounds pretty cool. I don't think we even need to filter it further. And I'm just going to bring the fader up gradually. Just to give it some character. There's a lot of 1K in this uh, in the room mic, so I'm just going to get rid of that. Sounds like one and a half. Yeah, somewhere around there. Just get rid of that. And now it sounds more open. And we can bring them down in level a little bit. That's great. Let's look at the toms now. Just loop around the toms. Um, once we have the toms kind of tight and clean, it's very easy to just use the louder to compress them. And then maybe to shape the tone a little bit with some EQ. So we're going to boost the fundamental, which would be around 200, I think. And then maybe take out yeah, something around there to just make it more open and less boxy. And I think we can, in general, bring the low end up a little bit. And then, let me just try to copy this to the next one. So obviously the low end is too much, and the fundamental frequency would be lower. So let's try something like that. And this one needs a little bit of brightening. So let's use this band. And we need to bring the level down. That sounds pretty good. Let's look at the floor drum. So that one needs a little bit of help in the mid-range. Maybe something like that. Now we can pan them. So we start from left, slightly right and right. Now we have some percussion, we have this loop, and for this one I want to get rid of some of the kind of nasty high mid in order for it to blend better with the, with the rest of the drum track. So I'm going to use the Renaissance Deesser. So as you, can, as you can see now, it basically reduces the high frequencies but I wanted to just target the high mid, so I'm gonna use this type and I'm gonna tell it to detect around 3K, something like that. Yeah, and that sounds a lot smoother if I bypass it. You can hear the transient at an unpleasant frequency. So here, this is still doing its job, which is to fill um, 
the kit with 16 pattern, but in a much more pleasant way. We also have a tambourine on this track. And this one can use a little bit of compression. We can use the Renaissance compressor to just tame it down a little bit. So we're gonna use no attack. I mean, minimum attack and quite high threshold. And now I can really control the, the actual hits. So just taming them a little bit. And I can do that in context. Also lower its level. side of the hi-hat. Now another thing we can do is use some samples triggered by the kick and snare and in order to do that I'm going to use Logic's um, drum replacement. There are many ways of achieving that. There are some plug dedicated plugins. What I like about this particular method is that it generates MIDI notes from the transient of uh, the drum. Uh, and that, uh, that allows for a great flexibility. Um, and I find it more useful than, than using uh, just drum trigger plugins. And I'll show you why. I will go and detect the transients. And I, I, see, I can see that they're pretty much there already. Um, I can tweak the sensitivity yeah, to make sure I capture all the hits. And that's what I want. And then I can just generate the trigger, um, the trigger track, which is, which is just MIDI, MIDI notes assigned to a sampler. Now I'm going to use um, Logic's uh, factory samples um, and just go through some electronic, uh, acoustic samples. So let's take that for instance. I'm just going to narrow the dynamic range. So I don't need all that dynamic. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And that adds some room to the sample. And I can listen to it together with a original drum. It just creates a nice space um, for that bass drum. I can repeat, let's repeat the, pro the same process with the snare drum. And uh, again, making sure that all the hits are detected, which they are, and then just create. And what I like about using MIDI is that we have the velocity zones, so uh, which and and also we can control them very easily. Uh, so let's look for some other snare drum sounds. So we need something quite high, which will gel nicely with the original snare drum hit. Actually, this one has a nice tone to it, and maybe we can, let's listen to it with the original snare drum sound, and maybe we can change the pitch. Yeah, 
Yeah, maybe we can pitch it up just a little bit, something like that. Now we can hear the whole drum track. So it sounds more kind of rich and produced. Yeah, and I'm quite happy with that for now. Obviously we have to see how it sounds with the rest of the tracks, especially the vocal, but as a starting point for uh, the mixing stage, this sounds pretty solid and I'm quite happy with that and we're ready to move on to the next stage.